Hello everyone and welcome to today's Fintech Finance Virtual Arena. Today we're going to be discussing how increased data transparency can actually combat fraud. And joining me I have Ralph Ingemandir and Omri Kletter from Bottom Line. So guys, thank you so much for joining me. I'm really excited to, to have you on the show here today because obviously you guys are pretty much specialists when it comes to this kind of thing. So uh, if I could get Ralph, could I get you to introduce yourself and uh, your role please uh, before we go any further? Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you, Doug. Um, so my name is Ralph Hitchman. I'm known as the ethical hacker, which is sort of a, uh, quite of a, a term, oxymoron of a term to do, but uh, I'm an entrepreneur, a public uh, speaker. I've been a, a global thought leader in the cybersecurity area for about 29 years now. Uh, authored a lot of the technical education that became certifications for corporate and government. Um, I'm also an expert in incident response and digital forensics. I've been a technical supervisor on a number of films and television shows, including uh, Snowden and uh, let's see, the uh, Mr. Robot, things that you might know. Um, wow. I'm an active Big member. Fan. Yeah, I dig it. Um, I'm an active member of the uh, EU startup community. Um, I started a business out in Estonia a few years back. I'm a contributor to Forbes, senior technology advisor to several organizations, and do a lot of international keynote speaking. So that's me. I'm Ralph. Brilliant. And Omri, could I get a bit of background to yourself and bottom line, please? Sure. Pleasure being in this forum and panel together with you, Doug and, and um, Ralph. So my name is Omri Kletter. I'm the global VP of product and strategy for our financial crime and fraud department in bottom line, what we call internally CFRM. I started my career in global counterterrorism or intelligence um, on global counterterrorism. And I can tell you one thing. Chasing the bad guys. When you st once you start with that in your career, it's very hard to change subject. And obviously, many of the methods we are using in order to find the uh, needle in the haystack is super relevant to the topic we are discussing today, fraud and financial crime in a very super modernized um, payment environment. Yeah, I can imagine. So, Omri, when it comes to payments modernization, um, getting straight into it, what have been some of the biggest advancements um, for the banks when it comes to payments modernization? Uh, yeah, that's a brilliant question. And first, we need to reflect on the fact that we are living in a very dramatic um, era in terms of the modernization of, of payments, right? So I would say the last two years and the upcoming five years are um, dramatically different than how we looked on, on the, the year, 10 years before, et cetera, et cetera. So this is one thing to recognize when we think about payment modernization is really the rapidness and the dramatic moment. This is really the decisive moment uh, for many uh, big parts of the industry. I would mention two things. <clears throat> One is when we think about the what impacts the change or what is the picture of the change. I would highlight the changes in speed. This is true, for example, when we think about uh, the US in instant payments. It's dramatically different in terms of volume. And we can think of ourselves almost as a signal producers. You know, Ralph, myself, you, Doug, like how many signals we produce, how many different methods of payments we produce as a single entity. And you can multiply it by, by the numbers of Go. So we talk about speed, we talk about volume, and obviously the popularity. Many of the things we used to do almost in, in a very different environment through plastic card and um, even cash are uh, gaining much more popularity on newer methods of payment. So we talked about speed, we uh, highlight the impact of volume and popularity. And if you think about it from a technology perspective, and we obviously very focused on that here in bottom line, how we really facilitate this growth and opportunity, this decisive moments of so many organizations. I would highlight only two examples. One is definitely the canonization of payment. We're seeing a uh, new standards like the ISO 222 that really, um, it's a, almost to rethink how a, a global standard canonized a, a format is being used across the globe. I think it's fascinating to see. And again, from a global point of view, the PC in bottom line, it's quite interesting to see. And the second element is open banking that dramatically changes the relationship between the customer and the organization. So we used to think that um, the organization, the FI, the, the, would control the communication between the customer and the bank. And when we are facilitating so many open banking capabilities, and again, this is a great focus area for us as bottom line from a payment perspective, we realize that the customer now can be represented not only by the own channel, the traditional channel, the online, the mobile, also through third party. So um, both the canonization and the open banking are dramatic uh, changes that obviously have so many implications when we think about fraud and financial crime. 
Incredible. And yeah, as you mentioned, there's been huge technological change, huge regulatory change with open banking being fueled in, in Europe. Now, Ralph, when it comes to, you know, we've heard these massive advancements in uh, technology and, and payment technology more specifically. Has there been equal advancements in fraud prevention? Well, yes, there has been, for the most part, there's been a lot more of a focus in, in, in terms of fraud prevention across the entire banking and, and transactional community. Um, and, and of course, because of other regulatory compliance and, and that sort of thing that, that have come down over the years, uh, it, it's, it's forced the industry to get better and better, better at, force, uh, at fraud prevention. If you look at many organizations, especially in Europe, uh, at least I, I, that was my experience, uh, a great deal of the workforce uh, of many of these organizations were focused on fraud prevention and even people who didn't work within those departments were very well trained on fraud prevention. So it, it's an area that certainly has been doing a lot, a lot better, right? When it comes to the technology, of course, um, more and more of the of sort, I guess you want to use the, the term machine learning is being used um, from the perspective of security for fraud prevention, right? And from overall security as a whole, right? Looking at, uh, at traffic and looking at, at patterns in transaction processing, uh, source and destination, you know, net flow data, all of that is being, is, is now something that, you know, honestly, even five years ago, I didn't see as much of in the, uh, you know, in the FinTech sector. So it certainly has gotten better and, and continues to get better. And I think it's, uh, it is, it is something that is, is really drastically and dramatically bringing down the potential for fraud. Interesting. I, I know that the other question, but I really want to underscore, I think our point you know, is brilliant over there. We are definitely seeing advancement. I tell you two more things that I think um, complementary to, to the things that uh, Ralph mentioned, again, from a bottom line perspective. So yeah, I, I agree totally. There is a, a graph of advancement we should you know, reflect. I think there were a few aha moments for the industry in terms of fraud prevention, but I would like to add two more things. First, um, on the other side, the bad guys, if you'd like, also advanced dramatically. We're seeing dramatic shift from what I would call, you know, we have here Ralph as a het ethical hacker. Obviously there are many non-ethical hackers out there and right? we're very privileged to be here on this panel. But we're seeing advancement from a, what I would call the singular, maybe dual hacking environments into organized crime involvement. And I would take it even to the next level. We're definitely seeing here almost state level in some cases, a fraud fund and organizations. And that's a different ball game. It's also, I think, call for action for us in the industry, how we react. And I think, you know, if, if I put myself on the board level perspective and I'm you know, head of payments or head of technology, I must make sure that we invest much more in these elements because the protection is not against one, two singular hackers with all their capabilities, whether to a much more advanced serious concerns out there. I can tell you that, again, this is our focus area to make sure that we're helping the band full evolve. And, you know, we talk a lot about technology. People is also very important. I think to, you know, think about um, the things that Ralph is bringing to the table and generally, I would say experts in these elements into these organizations. We're seeing more and more FIs come say, hey, we need to build this new almost paradigm of fraud experts in the organization, not just the involvement of payment or another one. So. Uh, having expert data, data, dedicated data scientists in the bank for that. Uh, uh, so that's definitely part of the involvement, not just the technology, but also how we, with people and process. Yeah, it's interesting to hear that cultural advancement and, and change to actually have to start bringing in the people who know, uh, rather than just relying on the technology to, to, to defend the, this data and defend the banks. Um, now, I kind of want to get into real use cases. Um, and I, I don't want to focus on the pandemic too much, um, but I mean, Ralph, have you seen um, any devastating new fraud attempts that have come about as a result of the pandemic um, and, and the increasing usage of digital banking by cons uh, customers? Um, well, that's a, that's a great question. And it's one that, uh, you know, because of the amount of, uh, of focus that has been on the pandemic, you're, you I'm sure you've all noticed that you're not really seeing a lot of news coming out about much else, right? With the exception of a few other topics that are kind of hot uh, around the world, but you're not really seeing the amount of, of, of press covering uh, potential breaches or breaches and that sort of thing uh, at all, unless it is somehow connected to some, you know, political situation or things of that nature. However, I can tell you from my 
uh, let's call it research in, in, in as, as Amri was saying, on the dark side of things is that they are happening, right? Uh, they're not really being covered or, or being, uh, uh, you know, told to the public that much yet because, it, you know, they're not, uh, you know, it's, it's something that we're going to feel the impact of much later down the road as far as breaches in this area. Um, the, the one area that I think is really taking a hit when it comes to, to, to in general fraud, believe it or not, is in the crypto space, right? I have had so many cases and so many, uh, you know, both friends and 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 not and just people that, that, that have come to me who've had, you know, an incredible amount of money that's been uh, stolen in cryptocurrency because a lot of people have been obviously kind of, you know, wetting their feet in the in the cryptocurrency space. Yeah. So that's more so than than, you know, the typical banking or transactional type of, of processing um and that's been kind of alarming right because the the, the interesting part about it is uh, many of these people who you would think really need, know what they're doing right if they're if they're dropping money into things like cryptocurrencies you know generally really don't right and you'd be surprised to how many times this is you know this is happening right now where you know hundreds of thousands of dollars are being stolen um uh, in in just things like you know their wallet being stolen you, you, a lot of people don't even fully understand that you're not supposed to give up your private key. So um, it, it's it's kind of alarming what's happening there. Um, and that's an area that doesn't really have much, if any, real fraud prevention as far as the type of systems that we have in banking. Um, but on the banking side of things, like I said, it's really gotten a lot tougher. So it, it, it is definitely changing. The landscape is changing quite drastically because, of course, yes, the technologies have gotten better. Uh, on the fraud side of, of, of this, but uh, in general, it's it's uh, it's it's changing quite drastically to to be monetized. They're still monetizing it pretty much the same way uh, yeah. on the criminal side, but in a very different landscape. That's really interesting. I mean, it sounds like a, a good year to kind of bury bad news. Um, yeah, Omri. So, so I think um, the question. I think first it's important uh, question to reflect on. And I would say um, we are sitting in a, you know, as part you know, we're a global company. We ha we are seeing different things in different data centers. We have you know Singapore and London and the U.S. in two places, and, and, and London and Asia, and, and even in Switzerland. So different things you'll see in different places. If there is one thing that we learned very well as a society from this pandemic, is that it's very important to watch what happens in different territories because it tend to follow, right? Kind of vi viruses are without borders. And I would definitely say that foreign financial crime is a phenomena. We shouldn't think about the traditional borders. And I think some of the new, uh, Ralph alluded to some of that. So we are very keen. We're working on trying to customers to, to see what's happening in different data centers, understand that things will, will move here and there and everywhere. When we think about uh, it, your question about what is changing in fraud in, in these specific times, if to basically categorize three flavors of fraud, first, first party fraud, which is the traditional case that the customer is the fraudster, if you like, and third party fraud where the customer is the victim, there is also a third layer, a great focus area for us because we have dedicated solution for that, which is internal fraud, which is the employee is the fraudster. I would definitely say that a, under a pandemic situation, unfortunately, both the first party fraud customer as a fraudster or kind of illegal triangle of account opening, whatever. And unfortunately also internal fraud that could actually have a, a almost catastrophic um, impact on the organizations is definitely on the rise. And we can all understand why because of the stress and distress, people moving remotely and the changes that we referred before on, on payment. So we need to be aware of that. In the end, uh, one of my best mentors on fraud taught me that fraud tends to follow speed, follows popularity, and follows confusion. And if you think about all these three things, we can definitely see what happens if there is a new scheme for loan application uh, after COVID and that creates a lot of confusion because it's not clear who is doing what. The stress create again some you know popularity of let's do digital payments more and more. Obviously good for us to a certain degree, but a challenge. So um, think about the speed, think about the popularity, think about the confusion and you understand it's almost like a Patrick plate uh, for Ford 
in, in the pandemic era, but to your point, pandemic is, is you know, we need always to think be, kind of be, what happened before and what will happen after. We can't, you know, we can't plan only in a COVID-19 type of uh, scenario. Exactly. Now, you know, speaking of going cross-border like the virus and that increased speed, um, we've seen new payment products like Swift GPI, um, ISO, uh, Realtime, Visa B2B. Um, you know, how have they changed the industry and how can banks realistically prevent fraud that, you know, when the payment is going at these speeds and across various different countries? So I think we definitely need to adapt to this new normal from a payment perspective. Again, there are so many opportunities when you think about the organization, the modernization, there are so many opportunities for banks to be more efficient, more data driven, to facilitate cloud and reduce the total cost of ownership. So it's almost a very positive, perfect storm. Uh, when we think about the fraud prevention element to that, I would say two things. If I'm again, if I put myself in the shoes of the head of payment, head of operations, I would definitely make sure that I'm bringing my fraud and compliance uh, members much earlier in the game uh, than uh, you know, uh, planning it to the later phases. This is critical to understand that fraud and financial crime must be almost enabler to facilitate this modernization. Because if we want to do real time, if we want to do inter borders and we still coming with the old techniques, it, it will break, right? So that's one thing that almost is the best practice. And we, we are working with clients. We do see the benefits of, of planning in advance towards that. Secondly, and Ralph mentioned before the advancement around technology, mainly around analytics, right? Our ability to use smart computing and understanding each and every transaction. We heavily invest in machine learning as I've mentioned before, both supervised and unsupervised. I think we need to realize that there is kind of all these changes that you talk about from a payment perspective, create a new normal, which makes it harder to profile, harder to do in real time. So again, as much as you can do it faster, as much as you can plan in advance and train, this, train the models to be ready, you will be in a better uh, phase. Work internally in the organization between financial crime and the payment type and go out to the industry to adopt these best practices uh, from organizations or vendors that focus on these topics. Brilliant. Ralph, would you, you know, you appreciate um, being brought on far sooner in this kind of product launch or in, in these new kind of financial uh, payment services? Uh, just like Ami said, the, the, the earlier, the sooner, the better. I think one of the biggest mistakes that many, I mean, I was going to say technology organizations, but it's not technology, right? We're all technology organizations. Even if you sell shoes, you're in technology nowadays. So uh many organizations make the mistake of not including if you want to if, if that's the right word to use but not including uh the right back to what Amri said the right human resources early enough in the process to evaluate what is truly needed right because uh because at the end of the day this is all a matter of risk management we have to we all know that in business we have to deal with it and in life we have to deal with acceptable risk right we have to identify there are risks that we're going to identify and say well that's a risk that you know, we have to be able to deal with, um, but there are risks that we certainly can mitigate. And, that, and, and that's really the, the, the whole name of the game here is how do we mitigate and reduce risk? There's no way we can completely get rid of it. That's never going to happen. Um, but we, we, we can make it and work within a certain uh, framework, right? And oftentimes with, with many organizations, there's not enough, uh, as Amri was saying, enough of, of the right resources, both technologically, but more importantly, the human resources involved early enough in the process uh, of evaluating the risks involved and evaluating the products and services that are out there uh, to mitigate that risk. Interesting. It's, it's what I'm really hearing is, is how, you know, these technologies have changed, but the human element is still so core to everything in, the, in this. Now, I mean, speaking of, you know, Ralph, you brought up frameworks. Um, how, uh, Omri, could I get your input on this? You know, how do you see the migration to ISO 222 in 2021? You know, what's that going to mean for banks when it comes to fraud prevention? Um, so there are two elements for that. I, I'm sure, by the way, this, this is a very strong question that many organizations are asking themselves, asking themselves while we speak, right? So the, I, I know it's high on the agenda of many organizations that we work with. Um, we, we talked before around analytics, but I think when we think about uh, the new changes with the ISO 222 and all other things, we must underscore the importance of data. And I think in the, in the end, this is a data opportunity, right? We have the ability to consume more data and fraud detection loves data. 
you, know, you mentioned before the human element. One of the biggest challenges today when we think about the involvement of fraud is actually not in cases that someone hacked at the accounts and, and printed and pretended to be the customer. There are cases where the technology used by the bad guys was so sophisticated that actually the transaction has been authorized by the genuine customer. What we hear sometimes in the UK being called APP, authorized push payment. We are very focused on that. And when you think about confirmation of payee solutions, other things that we are doing in the market. When you think about you know, business email compromise, again, we are all focused on business payments. So data is critical in order to make these discussions because in the end, the target in front of us, especially in the cases of authorized fraud, is not just, just to understand what happened. Is it uh, the original customer? Is it genuine? But we also need to ask ourselves, what was the intent? And I think I tie to the question around ISO because it's a data opportunity, right? We have the ability not just to consume the traditional fields that, you know, the attributes related to the, to the event, but if we really plan it properly, if we really modernize the payment platform and we make sure that our fraud solution is tightly coupled with it, so we know what are the receive, you know, how the receiving end looks, so we know how to consume the data, we know how to profile the data, and then we're in a better, better spot, again, not just to figure out what happened, but really to ask ourselves, do we understand the intent behind the payment? <coughs> I think when you think about these cases of catastrophic losses, when you think about these cases of business and compromise or authorized push payment, understanding the intent is critical. Um, and I think uh, the new payment modernization gives a great opportunity to have more data relevant for that. Interesting. And Ralph, can I ask, obviously, we've, we've been bringing up how having um, you know, this increased human element is going to be so critical to fighting fraud. Um, but how critical is having clear, transparent data for the humans to then action on? How critical is that data set going to be going forward now that we're completely digital? You know, I think it's, it's absolutely critical. Um, in fact, I, I would argue and and this is one of this is one of this is one of those that we could really get into for hours, really. But I would argue that data has value only because the more secretive the data is, the more value it has, especially to the criminal community um, or for criminal use. Uh, the more transparent data is, the less value it has. In that sense, you know, it has the same value to the legitimate players, right? But if if for example, you know. If all of our information was accessible to everyone, all right, and it was, and, and our systems were being built in a way where you know it's sort of a sort of the saying in cryptography where you know a, a system should be secure not because of the secrecy of of the of the of the algorithm, right? Um, it, it it's the same thing here. All of a sudden, if we had systems that were more and more transparent, that data then becomes less and less usable by the the, the let's call it the criminal elements uh, of it. So the question is, is back to sort of the things that Omni was saying was, you know, classification of data, having a real understanding, because the truth is we don't, we don't still yet fully, and especially on a global scale, um, you know, understand uh, or have come to an agreement on, you know, things like privacy. That, that, that in itself is a very good, you know, good word that we throw around all the time. But if I ask somebody, well, what, you know, what do you think should be private? Uh, the, the answers are not always going to be the same, right? In between people. Do you think your phone number should be private? No, I give that to people all the time, right? Uh, do you think your email should be private? No, I, I give that. Do you think your bank account should be private? Yes, it should be. W really, why? Because interestingly enough, I've been in, you know, in, in countries like Estonia, where the, uh, you know, and this is a, you know, quick story here, but you know, I, I went with my daughter to a heavy metal concert in the middle of nowhere, right? And there's no ATMs or anything around. And I took like maybe 150 euro, you know, and this is a camping in the middle of nowhere. So the next day, I don't have any more money because I spent it buying some stuff. And she comes up to me and says, hey, well, my buddy, who's a 16 year old kid, metalhead, he's got some cash and you can just, uh, you know, give him the money. And I had, I had an, I have a, an account in Estonia. So this 16 year old kid gave me a hundred euro while he gave me his bank account number. And I just moved it over from my bank to his bank. Now, something like that is so culturally, so culturally wrong in the, in, in the U S in the U S if somebody asks you for your bank account number, your immediate response is 
no. Like, why would you want that, no right? Way. <laughs> That's completely normal, right? On that side of the world. So if culturally, we haven't really fully agreed upon, you know, the classification of certain data and what should be transparent and what shouldn't be transparent and with, with good reason is what I'm saying. Without a good reason and understanding, why should a bank account be transparent? The account number itself, if having that in its own is enough to, commit, to be able to, to commit fraud, well, we got bigger issues to deal with. I, I can't agree more uh, on this specific topic and I want to kind of almost to connect it to, to the focus areas of us because in the end, um, it's so critical to understand that things that we try to keep in that phase actually help the fraudsters and not helping detecting it. This is critical. And I think um, you ask, you know, we should ask ourselves as an industry, what can we do better in the end? Can we ask, is it evolving? You know, you ask, is fraud is on the rise? And I would ask, why not? Are we kind of, why, why it won't go up? Are we doing enough to reduce it? And obviously we heavily invest in technology and I see great results and outcomes. You know, there is nothing nicer to have a call with the customer and say, hey, we were able to take the system and it take eight cases of fraud in the last month that save us 200K. So obviously, you know, we invest and, and we see the, the benefits of it. But if we really want to unleash the full potential of, of fraud protection, we must think about sharing data between organizations in a much smarter way. Um, I had a brilliant meeting with one of the um, head of frauds in, in one of the banks in, in the Nord, Nordics recently. And then I asked him, was, you know, last night, late night, I asked him, and how do you work with your competitors on that? I said, Omri, my competitors are not the other banks. My competitors are the fraudsters. And for me, it was a aha moment to realize. And, and obviously, they, they created a network of sharing information and char- sharing, obviously, a bad list of accounts. And, all the, and I think this type of understanding is critical. We are working hard to provide smarter, advanced technology to banks. We will work hard to make the payment revolution answered through technology. But more than that is needed. I know it's funny to say it from more than that is needed. And I think breaking the walls between the organization would definitely be a key thing. We are happy to facilitate. We need to remember all these things are happening in a much stronger technological environment with cloud, security. So the ability to do it, you know, what Ralph is talking about is much more feasible today than again five ten years ago so we need to take advantage of that instead of running away from the full potential of of... yeah i mean it's really interesting obviously with open banking before open banking we've been told never share your card details as we see you know as you said ralph in the us that'd be bonkers um but now you know we're being asked to considerably you know give away far more financial information um because it's open and it is actually safe so, Omri, following on from what you were saying, we need to have a cultural change where banks start talking to each other. Have you seen any interbank collaboration, Omri, recently where we have actually changed culturally our mindset around that and actually started to talk to each other, well, the banks at least, to fight fraud? So we definitely see advance, advancement over there. Um, I can tell here in the UK we, we are in a a different situation. I have I have many discussions, not just with banks, but also with organizations like CIFAS, uh, really trying to think about on a fraud and more collaborative way. So I'm, I'm very encouraged by the advancement I'm seeing. It's still, you know, you're seeing differences between cases, it's like bottom up, the organizations, the banks fuel it and create it, and sometimes something that is being facilitated top down. Uh, so I, I urge the regulators to do more around that and to address some of the points that Ralph mentioned before. Um, I'm, I'm again, I'm encouraged by that. I'm invested heavily to provide a technological platform that will enable it. Um, and I'm looking forward to see more and more that being done in addition to investment on analytics and uh, the investment on data. And by the way, also the investment on investigation and, and operations. So, you know, we talked about the impact of, of velocity and fraud. And we, we spoke about the fact that we create more and more signals. The reality is that even if we improved by two times our detection capabilities, if the data velocity increased three times, we need to be more efficient on operations. I, you know, I tasked my team, we need to make an eight minute investigation into two, three minutes investigation. And we, we need to unleash the full, you know, full potential of visualization or smart alert management. We are heavily invested in that because again, it's not only the detection part, but also the post detection elements are critical when we think about uh, redu- reducing the total cost of ownership and being ready to the 
payment modernization that we are talking about now. Brilliant. And I mean, we've talked about having to you know, ha have that really hard shift to kind of change the culture for banks. But let's be honest, one thing that go moves slower than a bank is probably governments and regulators. So I mean, uh, Ralph, can you tell me, how can organizations look to, to keep up with the regulatory framework and how can regulators look to, to keep up with these bad agents um, when, when the technology, especially within payments, is changing just so quickly? Well, and, and well, it, with pay, along with the technology is changing with payments, you have technology changing with the criminals who are, who are doing the fraud, right? So the, the, uh, the issue is that it, what it is, is it's very cultural across the board. I mean, it, it's cultural down to the consumer and all the way into the, you know, governments and organizations that are driving that. If you think about it, you know, you have what I'll call the, the bleeding edge, right? The bleeding edge of technology. Then you have the leading edge of technology with most of the solutions that, that we sell, right? Uh, and that organizations buy, uh, buy are really on the more of the leading edge, right? But hackers and, and the criminals are using bleeding edge techniques and tools. Um, it's always ahead, right? And then when you keep going through the technology, ultimately you end up in this, in this area of compliance and legal and so on and so forth. Um, they're always years behind. The law is always years behind the criminals. The, you know, the technologies are always behind the criminals uh, as well because they're on the bleeding side of things, or on the leading side of things. Then you come into regulatory compliance and governments and all their involvement. By the time it's got, it gets there, the truth is we're addressing issues that are maybe five to 10 years old as far as, as regulations and compliance is concerned, right? Yeah. There's no doubt that it's gotten a lot better. There's no okay. doubt that it's pushing organizations to do things that they wouldn't typically do. But one of the issues I generally have with a lot of these uh, compliance issues or compliance regulations is that, you know, they're very gray. And, you know, they're written by lawyers, if you will. And in the sense that what does that actually mean in, in reality, you know, yeah. to do these things that they because a lot of them are not really that specific all data should be private or all data should be protected uh what is what does that mean what does protected mean uh you know i still struggle with this one issue that i'm sure omni will get a laugh out of define a system is a system one computer or a hundred thousand computers yet you drop the word system everywhere in all these compliance documents and all these regulations without ever really defining what does that mean is, is my phone a system is my phone part of the system? So it, it, it's it's uh, it's always a struggle here because we're dealing with two almost, it's like, you know, they're speaking one language, we're speaking a different language, right? And then somehow, you know, the moderator is a, is a doctor. It sounds like we need to have a, an ethical hacker lawyer uh, type situation coming in um, by the sounds of it. And so Omri, yeah, how do, you, how do you think the banks can, you know, we've talked about how we're gonna try and keep the regulators from catching up? How can the banks catch up to both the technology and then the regulators? So uh, first, I think I, I'm working with many of this, these organizations and uh, I can tell you they're working around the clock to definitely catch up. So, you know, I, I, I do want to say that again, I'm very encouraged by how uh, banks, at least the, the ones that work with us, um, invest much more than before on these specific questions. Uh, I, I think there are almost three um, pillars they need to focus on. One is the data, and we talk, talked about it, so almost to change completely the work on data, to make sure that data from different sources get into a centralized space and be fused into these uh, fraud solution. I think the payment revolution helps us actually. It's, it's a facilitator and enabler on that. So that's one pillar. The second thing is around analytics, and I would underscore a one thing around analytics. Traditionally, many of these organizations say we'll have a solution, a vendor like from bottom line or others that will do for us the analytics. And obviously we're investing that. But I think smart kind of smart organizations are actually not just working on uh, what will be coming out of a vendor, but really develop their own data science team to again, unleash the full potential and actually extract the uniqueness of each and every organization. We know that different organizations behave differently. 
um, a, from size perspective, from focus, from different payment types. So I would really encourage organizations to, in addition to do, working very strongly with the vendor, also develop their own data science capabilities around analytics. Um, I can tell you that when I'm thinking about the next generation, it's not just investing in our own um, analytics, but also how we provide do-it-yourself, bring your own type of analytics and feed it into the execution platform. And the third layer, um, third pillar, if you like, if we talk about data and analytics, the third one would be definitely operations. And I think organizations must think how they fight alert fatigue, how they make eight minute investigation into three minute investigation, unleash the power of automation and robotics in operations. And we must think differently on how we cooperate with all. I can say another thing. I see a great advancement in organizations working with the end customers to solve the fraud problem. It tends to think there is kind of, there is transaction happening. It, it's being thrown into the bank and the bank will take care of that. I can tell you that smart organizations are actually playing almost ping pong. Hey, is it you? Can we get more data? Please validate. And almost quote unquote, cuddle with the customers, both retail and, and corporate customers. And the last point, you know, we were very focused on how banks should evolve. Here's another thing that I'm seeing dramatically evolving in terms of fraud and financial crime. Corporates and specifically multinational corporates. These organizations must think themselves much closer to bank, even if they are not yet regulated. And believe me, they will be more and more regulated from a fraud and financial crime perspective as we're seeing on banks. Currently, there is almost anomaly between a small bank that will be strongly invest in fraud solutions and financial crime solution into a multinational corp kind of corporate that might do more payments this, than this small bank. And you still ask yourself, who owns fraud over there? Oh, we have someone that actually doing few things and fraud is one of them. So that's definitely something that um, we'll see happening in the industry in the coming month. We are working not just with banks on this uh, question or problem around modernization of payments and fraud and financial crime, but also with multinational corporates. And I would underscore the importance of that if I'll just... So, I mean, Ralph, you know, throwing it back to you then after uh, what Omri said, you know, would you put data transparency and the, the quality of data as that number one pillar and everything falls into place underneath? I definitely would. I think that's, that's the right approach. Uh, I think that's the wise approach. Um, I think that's the, the clear approach is that we really have to define, like I said, those things and, and data transparency, I think ultimately is a good thing. You know, it, 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 it like I said, it, 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 it puts the data, uh, where it belongs. Uh, and, and that means not in the hands of those that are, that are using it for malicious use and, and, and coming at it with malicious intent. So I believe so. I think it's a very interesting issue and it's one that, again, we have yet to really, uh, adopt that concept of data transparency. I think we, you know, we use that term a lot, but you know, we don't really necessarily put it into practice. Right. Um, and I think it's, it's, a, it's just part of our evolution in general. Uh, I think it's an evolutionary process here that we're going through just in, in life, but especially when it comes to payment processing and fraud. Excellent. And, uh, you know, just to wrap up, cause we're coming to the end of the session now. Um, could I get, uh, both your opinions, you know, could, could we get your words of wisdom, some pearls of wisdom that you would tell to the financial institutions to kind of steer them in the right direction? Omri, could I get your input, please? So, yeah, sure. So I would um, uh, almost repeat the focus areas of uh, data analytics and investigation and understand well, kind of almost reflect on the point we are. Uh, so many organizations are thinking on the payment modernization, foreign financial crime, is tight, a tightly coupled topic to that. And I urge organizations to think about that as a one joint problem and making it almost an enabler. I think organizations that will be able to convert the fraud of financial crime from a defect or a challenge into an opportunity, we serve better customers, we are safer, we're heavily invested in that. That's a big part of what they will be selling in the coming years, almost as a, as a value and a virtue. Um, and doing this shift is critical. Again, I'm very encouraged by seeing many, many organizations actually going through this process without, uh, without uh, the regulation help even, but also with, with us, you know, helping them and uh, shaping this thinking. Perfect. And Ralph, could I get your, your words of wisdom for the banks? 
I think uh, I, I think one area that, that the banks really, really need to focus on is awareness across the board. Uh, as Omri said, you know, realizing that the, the client, if you will, whether it be a business or an individual, is is the whole reason you exist, uh, right. is important. And, and making them safer is a is, is not just a matter of putting in technologies and hiring people. It's also a matter of building the right culture with even within your, within your client base, not just your employee base. And that is a culture of safety, not a culture of security. People get this mixed up because we drop the cybersecurity term all over the time as if this is a security issue. No, this is a safety issue, right? We are looking to operate in a safer environment and make these transactions safe. For some reason, the moment you start putting security into the word security, into anything, it's sort of like de dealing with the bouncer at the club. You don't really want to deal with it, okay? <laughs> if you can get around it, you get around it. But the moment we do, we can say that at least psychologically, we all want to be safer, right? Uh, in every way. Uh, so so put, you're kind of instilling this, this culture of safety within the organization and its clients and its partners and so on is critical uh, beyond all of the things that um, we said about you know analytics are key and so on and so forth but uh, it, it is a very cultural and sort of psychological uh, thing that we need to drive home and that is that, uh, that you know we're here to make things safer amazing guys thank you so much for your time i hope you've both enjoyed yourselves absolutely it's been absolutely brilliant so guys thank you so much and to all our viewers you can catch the rest of the series and much more over at www.fintechf.com and of course youtube and linkedin so i hope to see you there and guys have a great evening ciao